today I'm talking to a very fine actor who had a hero's exit from the bill, but for the last two decades he's been a real life hero to millions thanks to his incredible charity work. We chatted via Skype, so apologies to the odd audio dropout, but as a whole, technology did us proud. Nick Redding, welcome to the Bill Podcast. Thank you, Oliver. Well, I'm really grateful to you for making the time to chat. Can you picture the scene for us? Where, where, where are you talking to us from right now? I'm talking to you from the slopes of Mount Kenya, up above an area called Samburu, which is where one of our projects is with the Samburu tribe, where we are doing work around HIV and female genital mutilation abandonment. And I can see for about... 250 miles across some beautiful African landscape. It's a nice spot. Usually I, I ask the actor at the end to nominate a charity that, that's particularly close to their heart. I think here, because this is such a... <laughs> Boy, an, a hard one. It, yeah, yeah. This is such an ex, you know extraordinary achievement, what you've done. Please tell us all about SAFE. I'd love for the listeners to know all about it. And, and then at the end, we'll chat about how they can help. OK, well, um, so in 2000, I was uh, I was in a film called Croupier. I don't know if you remember it. Oh, yeah. It was a Mike, a Mike Hodges movie with Clive Owen playing the croupier and I played his um, rather sleazy publisher and uh, the New York Times had reviewed it and they gave me a name check which of course got more, my agents jumping up and down in America going Nick you know get out of here <laughs> and um, I think by, I'd started to reach a point where I was uh, getting a bit bored I mean I was doing very well but I was I don't know. Acting was great fun, but I'd done it for a long time. And I was I think I was starting to look for something else. And while I was in Los Angeles, I was introduced to a Kenyan pediatrician who was an assistant professor at NYU Medical Center. And he specialized in pediatric HIV. And he was being part funded by a brilliant friend of mine called Lee Blake, who ran all the Red Hot charity campaigns, Red Hot and Blue, the Cole Porter covers. I don't know if you remember them, mm. but like char AIDS charity records in that they started in the 80s. And she would just started going back into her charity work and she'd met Shafiq and he wanted to go back to Mombasa, which was his hometown and establish a pediatric HIV unit in the public hospital in Mombasa and try and offer some of the services to mothers and children that he was offering in New York, low dose antibiotics, food supplements, and probably most critically, psychosocial support, somewhere where women could go and meet other women and say, yeah, I've got it, you've got it, uh, and just have kind of outlet. Because at that time, there was an enormous amount of stigma surrounding the disease. So many women when they were diagnosed, usually when they were going through the maternal child health unit, were too frightened to tell their family because there were many stories of women who were chased away by their families when they were diagnosed as positive, even though they'd probably caught it from their husband. And I was just enthralled by what he wanted to do. And I started doing voluntary work for him while I was in Los Angeles between auditions and got him equipment for his laboratory. We got about $30,000 worth of equipment for him in the end. And then said to him one day, do you want someone to come with you? And he said, yes. And that was really how it all started. Um, so I went to Mombasa and I spent six months with him in the hospital building the clinic. And, you know, there are a lot of surprises. You go from, you know, Hollywood La La Land to a public hospital in Africa. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd made a film with Bruce Beresford in Nigeria in 1990. And so I'd traveled through Africa. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a sort of, innocent in 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 many ways but it's still you know the children's ward and um, some of the harshness of the realities of the medical provision that is available in Africa is quite shocking but I think the thing that really astonished me more than anything else was the failure of public health education I mean this is 2001 now so we're at least 20 years into the epidemic, two decades into the epidemic, and we would have one smart, intelligent woman after another who would come into the clinic and she'd know nothing about the disease she was carrying. Wow. And I was just like, why has no one told her? You know, she I mean, she might be a rural, illiterate woman, but she was highly intelligent. 
She's quite capable of understanding a complex medical issue and no one had told her. And you combine that with massive stigma, witchcraft, superstition, huge barriers towards getting people to come forward for testing, of course, but also to accept the nature of the disease. So I started asking around, you know, well, you know, I thought, well, what's my profession doing? You know, theatre and education. I've, you know, I did some of that when I first started as an actor. I, w- I went around schools in the UK doing children's theatre. So I started asking around and, and, and it had developed a bad name, theatre and education in, in, in the developing world. And people were like, ah, you know, there's always little plays going on about AIDS. I said, well, let's do a big play. Let's find the best actors in Mombasa. So we, I went round and I went looking at different theatre troupes. I mean, I went to see this one theatre troupe and they were just brilliant. And you could see, I couldn't speak any Swahili then, but you could see that they were world-class performers. And some of them I'm still working with today, 16 years later. Um, but anyway, so we devised the play together with Shafiq and other doctors from the hospital and just talking about all the issues around, around HIV and with a really cracking good tale to hang it all on. And we went out and went out into the communities and basically try and promote the clinic as well, because we were having, because of the stigma, a lot of people were very frightened to come to the clinic. And the moment we started performing, everyone was, I mean, with the chiefs, the women's groups, the public health officers, the clinicians, they were all saying the same thing, which was basically, where have you people been? Mm. You know, this is what we need the community to understand. And it wasn't rocket science. I mean, we just told them a good story. I think crucially, we made them laugh. I mean, there's a lot of very good comedians in the company. You know, when you make people laugh and you engage them, you know, move them with a good story, they like you. And they're like, okay, what do you want? (laughs) And it's a, it suddenly was like, ah, this is a, this is the most brilliant way of, of providing public health education, which was so woefully inadequate, and at the same time entertaining people, and at the same time providing employment to the best young actors in Kenya. And here we are sort of 16 years later. Um, the charity is called SAFE, Sponsored Arts for Education. And so we have SAFE Pwani, which means coast in Mombasa. Then the second company is in the Nairobi slums, and that's called SAFE Ghetto. And then the two other companies are with more traditional tribes, where one in an area called the Loiter Hills, which is quite near the Maasai Mara, the famous game reserve. And that's called Safe Ma, Ma being the culture, the language um, of the Maasai people. And then the one that I'm working with at the moment is um, in the north of Kenya, which is another very traditional tribe called the Samburu. It's called Safe Samburu. And with those Samburu and the Maasai tribes, we use traditional culture, because when I was taken, I went, I went up for a, a ceremony where a, a, a photographer had invited me when I just started the project in the slums. And she was like, you've got to come. This happens once every 10 years. And I was like, oh, well, I can't. You know, I'd love to. But I'm, you know, I'm stuck. You know, I'm busy in, in, in Nairobi. And she was like, it happens once every 10 years. Yeah. And I was like, OK, yeah, no, that does sound quite good. All right. <laughs> and it was mind blowing. I found myself on the top of these hills where there's no development, there's no tourism. And it was the graduation of junior elders. Uh, and I met a school teacher, Amos, who was doing some translation for me and got to know him. And then he started telling me the challenges he was having. And uh, I, said, I said, all your Maasai songs, if we could use those. And he said, well, then, you know, that's what they are. They are traditionally a way of passing information. So we devised a performance. It took about a year to put the whole thing together. But we went, then we went out on the road with a performance of, of Maasai song and story. And it's true, as we travelled across the hills, if we missed the Boma, a homestead, the women from the homestead would come out and chase us over the hill and go, you've missed us, you've got to come back. Oh, wow. They're travelling with an important message and we need it. So it's using culture. At the moment, that was seen to be affected. Sarah Tanoi, who's the project manager, and the other project manager to the school teacher Amos, who I talked about, she came to me and said, Nick, can we do something about female genital mutilation? And I was like, yeah, okay, thinking, you know, it's like, this is the real taboo subject that nobody talks about. Mm. But it's, I mean, it's been one of our most impactful programs, because we were able to approach this subject from within the culture. And traditional culture in these communities is under attack, particularly from mobile phone technology and and motorbikes. So, you know, physically people can move around much faster. Um, But also the the 3G technology on, on mobile phones. You know, there's a real 
challenge now for the communities to, to hang on to their culture. And this is seen as something that is so integral to the journey into, into adulthood for a woman. And it was being pushed by men and women equally. And so we were able to create a Maasai performance of two songs for circumcision and a group of men and women who sing against it. And of course, they've got the best song and the best performers. And people defect over, they keep interrupting each other during the performance, and then a few people defect over. And then the ones who are real traditionalists, they say, the uh, progressives say to them, well, let's just talk about it. And that's how the show ends. And it's enabled us to start, it's like, performance and culture is a way of opening the door and then of course we have a mass of you know we do workshops with the elder men with the circumcisers themselves with the older women we run school clubs in all the all the schools we work with the warriors the morans of course and they are critical to the program because and we now have a performance group within the warriors because they are the future husbands of the girls who are going to be cut and for a lot of the poorer families their daughters dowry is an essential it's a lifesaver so if they don't feel their daughter will be married if she's uncut they will cut her we started that was a hundred percent of girls being cut and now it's less than 70 percent 30 percent of girls are now going through the alternate rite of passage if we can keep this momentum going we will stop circumcision in in that part of the world wow. so that it's that program that's being replicated down here in samburu because we were invited by one of the tourist travel comp um, safari companies to bring the Ma troop up here to perform because Ma and Samburu culture is very, very similar. And the language is, is, is um, they can understand each other's language. So we, per we performed up here and then some group of Samburu started getting together and they kind of for about a year were, or a year, maybe even longer, um, volunteering. And so for, until finally we went, OK, right, let's form Safe Samburu. So we're going to try and do the same thing. And we're starting again in another community, which is 100 percent. And they are I mean, we've had death threats from people. We've had people trying to throw stones at uh, smashing our vehicle windows and all because we're trying to stop circumcision. But at the same time, we've got incredible people in the community coming forward saying, don't stop. You can do this. So we're trying again. I know so many girls out there now who have gone through the alternate right and they're empowered young women. It's incredible what you're doing. I mean, what keeps you going? You've got constant challenges all around you, but mm. what, what is stopping you from giving up? Because this is, this is a long-term project, isn't it? There's no quick fix. You know, if you're going to do something like this, it's the longitudinal impact that is going to bring change. Mm. You can't just go in and sing a song about stopping FGM and expect people to stop. You know, you have to engage with people. You have to listen. You have to approach them, you know, with respect and mm. and without judgment. You know, however horrendous we think cutting is, to them it is a cultural norm. And you can never underestimate the power of a cultural norm. I mean, there are things that people would look at our society and probably go, my God, you know, I work with, an inc I mean, you know, I'm not alone here. I've got 30 plus full-time staff wow. and a huge team of, of part-time staff um, across the four programs. So, you know, and we're all, we're, we're doing this as a team. We are working together and, you know, it's, it's entirely community led. I mean, I'm providing the sort of the creative oversight in terms of how we do the performance and then we're designing the programs together. And am I right now that, I mean, you refer to Kenya now as home. Well, I mean, you know, it's a schizophrenic thing when you, you know, if you, I'm an immigrant, you know, I mean, it's a, you know, I've, I've made my home in another country, but you still have your family and your, all, all the people you love. So you, it's a, it's, it's not necessarily, it's got, a, it's, there's a price to pay. For you as Nick Redding on a personal level, what is it like living in Kenya for, for you, aside from all the incredible work you're doing? It can't be all work, work, work. There must be time where you need to rest and, you know, enjoy your life as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's bittersweet because you're surrounded by nature and you see the most extraordinary things. I mean, you can be driving to work and you suddenly your car is surrounded by a herd of elephants. Wow. And that kind of stuff is so precious. Mm. But you are also seeing it disappearing in front of you. 
rise. You're very conscious if you live here a long time of the fragility. And we also have we have an election coming in August. There's a lot of you know where where we're working. There was a we were trying to set up a workshop yesterday. There was a raid. Suddenly bullets are flying everywhere. I wasn't there. The project managers were there. And but we'd just been talking on the phone. And like 10 minutes later, they're phoning me back and they're, they're escaping from a, a shootout. Mm. And that's, you know, I mean, so there's a lot of tension at the moment between different tribal groups. It's fed by politicians a lot who they want to play to their own constituency so that they get their votes and they will demonize other communities in order to make people afraid. I mean, it's, you know, we see it happening in the UK, this sort of generating of fear in order to push an agenda and and manipulate a, a voting populace. Tense times, but, you know, hopefully things will settle down a little bit. But the north of Kenya is very, very um, uh, unsettled at the moment. There's been a lot, of, a lot of violence up there. If you had a time machine and could go back to 1988 and meet the Nick Redding of 1988 before starting on a bill, would, <laughs> would, would he have believed your life now? How would that have computed? Uh... I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, I was. I mean, I suppose I always had a thing that uh, you know anything was possible. Mm. So when I got the part in the bill, I'd just been travelling for about four months in the Far East. A great friend of mine, who I then introduced to Eamon Walker, and and he, she married him. Oh. But she was uh, she she was living in Japan, and I went to see her and spent a month with her in Japan, and then came back through Hong Kong, Thailand, and Burma. You know, just traveling on my own. You know, so I always, I'd always had that, that sort of, uh, you know, wanting to explore. I mean, I, when I was acting, I'd work and then I finished a job. And if there weren't any auditions or anything looking like it happened, I'd think, right, where do I want to go? And I'd sit in a bookshop with a load of travel guides and then go, ooh, the Galapagos, good. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> and then three days later, I'll be there, you know. It's like, <laughs> So, I mean, I think I think I would have been super pleased at what would have happened, but I, I don't think I would have expected it. I mean, you don't you don't really quite a sort of sharp turn. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I'm still you know, I mean, I you know, we've, we've made three feature films which have done extremely well and won a lot of awards on the festival circuit. And I've directed those. So I'm still hugely creative. It's not a, I mean, although it's charity, it's using the art, it's using what I did for 20 years. I've been doing a lot of work in Mombasa, um, and our last feature film was looking at um, radicalization of Islamic youth, which is another, you know, the same problem that, that Europe is facing up to so so harshly now. Mm. Kenya has exactly the same issues, you know, young men feeling very discriminating and marginalized and being seduced by extremist thought. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of terrorist attacks, two very famous ones, which you probably heard about, the Garissa University attack and the mm. Westgate shop. Um, but we've, you know, they are two of, I don't know, 200 attacks. I mean, we've had grenades thrown into buses. We've had, you know, there's a, it's been calmer the last few years. But, um, you know, we've been dealing with extremist terrorism for a long time. So, you know, all these issues are kind of are so important and you have to give your focus to all of them. So, you know, the, when you see families make a decision not to cut their daughters or people who were dying come forward and get on treatment for HIV and become a functioning work, you know, go, go back to work and start living their lives again, that, that for me makes it worthwhile. You explained about how creativity helps, and and where does that creativity come from? Is it was is it in the genes? Was there anyone in your in your family who were I mean, yeah, in the theatre? My mum was a, a dancer and choreographer and did a bit of acting. Oh wow! So just after the war, she sort of started doing those big touring theatre shows that used to go around the UK with all sort of all the variety artists. And so she did that until she was about uh, in her late twenties, and then she was like, "I'm I'm not going to grow old as a dancer." So she quit, and then she was personal assistant to Ginger Rogers and Olivia de Havilland on a couple of movies at Pinewood. Wow! Because the Dole office in Sunbury went, "You used to work in theatre." <laughs> Why would studios are asking to go in and be PA? And then she became a, a makeup artist at the BBC. Wow! And. That's Met my dad, um, who worked in music at the BBC. Oh, cool! Yeah, uh, so it was kind of a sort of arty household. So yeah, so it wasn't. I didn't make a huge leap by becoming an actor. But my favourite, my dad 
particularly really didn't want me to do it. Oh, really? Yeah. What kept you? Uh, oh, it doesn't. It sounds like you you do what you feel is right. So, uh, <laughs> what? what? Uh, well, I don't know. I just wanted to do it. I mean, it was uh, uh, academically. I was four O levels, I think, at fifteen, mm. and uh, and then worked as a stagehand in the West End. And uh, it's a shame if you fail academically at school, you then have to spend a lot of time as you, you, you find there are sort of massive holes if you don't really get a proper education. Um, but I don't regret leaving school at all. I mean, I just started, you know, I started work and, and I worked. And by the time I was 17, I'd got my equity card and I was working. Cool. Yeah. You'd achieved a lot by the time you joined the bill. So was this was Ramsey a straight offer? How, how did you become cast? Well, <laughs> well, they. Um, I'd been travelling a lot through the Far East, and I came back, and and they and my agent phoned up and said, "Oh, the, the bill is going to go twice weekly." It was when it was first went to those half hour episodes because it had been an hour on Friday night, and it was hugely popular as a show. And I'd I'd not really seen it, so I watched some episodes and thought, "Oh, this is really good show." Mm. And she said, "So that it's an a, a, an East Ender." Uh, you know, they gave me the sort of brief of Ramsey and she said, and they're looking for the real thing. And I went, well, what do you mean they're looking for the real thing? Well, they want an East Ender. And they said, well, I'm a Londoner. It's fine, you know. They said, no, no, they want to, they want to, you know, they all want Ramsey. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I was like, uh, okay, but, I'm, you know, I'm an actor. And she said, well, there's no rehearsal time. They don't want somebody who's going to be performing. So I went in to meet them all and I just played Ramsey at the audition. And I went in, I was like, all right, all right, shook their hand. And there's these three sort of very sort of like, you know, terribly nice, sort of quite sort of middle class television producers. And when you're in an audition normally, they ask a question which doesn't really, you know, you try and make the question interesting so you can say something interesting. But they'd ask a stupid question and I'd just kind of go and look out the window. And I like, just, uh, just behave. And they were like, this is Ramsey. And so then I was, I was playing to quote you. Oh, wow. <laughs> in Hyde Park uh, and sort of dancing with some girl in a, in a bandstand, as I remember. And um, we were dancing away and uh, and, and uh, I got a call going, oh, they want they want you to go back. To, it was up in Balby Road then, the old car factory mm. and uh, up top of Labrick Road. And um, so I went back up there and I sort of went in, and like, all right. And uh, <laughs> they were like, so um, we'd all like um, unanimously like to offer you the job. And I was like, Right. <laughs> Can I think about it? No. And they were like, uh, yeah, yeah. I said, I said, they think I'm the... <laughs> and they were, and so they said, uh, um, they said, well, you can't drop it now. And um, so I sort of kept it up when I, I went to work, and I was sort of fancy, you know. You know, I mean, it sort of shifted down, but I was always a bit like a bit more London than I than I was. So that's that's how I got the part. An observation on your body language. You you have a really cool movement as Ramsey. We, he's like a cool cat, but he's also you get the impression this guy could kick off and do some serious damage at any minute. He's sort of cool cat wow. slash predator. I, mean, you know, I thought he was a prat when I read the, <laughs> the thing, and I thought, oh great, I could play this real sort of like. I, I mean, I was going to make him racist as well because yeah. I thought everyone's going to hate him, but of course the kids loved him. So I was like, I had to backpedal really fast. So I was like, okay, well, then if, if they love him, even though why would you love someone who's such an ass? <laughs> but if, you know, if they love him, then I can't be, you know, I can't be, I can't be racist. And the great thing was Eamon, who played Haynes, mm. because all the writers were like, oh, the bad boy and the black cop, you know, yeah. we'll put them together. So we got loads of scripts coming in for the two of us. And, and him and I are still best mates. Oh, um, you know, and, and as I said, I introduced him to his wife and um, godfather to his kids. I mean, we just we just got on so well right from the get go. And so we had a we had a really good sort of partnership on screen. Oh, yeah. I think it's one of the all time great partnerships. I mean, genuinely, the, the chemistry between you both, you could have easily had your own series. I know there's a, there, there was sort of murmurs of that. I don't know. It never really came to anything. And I think by the time by the time I'd done a year, I'd 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 I'd, I'd sort of I'd, I would I'd had enough. <laughs> I'd had enough of Ramsey. I mean, I lo I loved him by then. I I got out thinking he was a right ass, and I and I really enjoyed him. But you know, by the time you got to a year. I mean, I got you get a script and you think, uh huh, uh huh, okay, he's going to do that. All right, yeah, oh, he wouldn't do that, right? Oh no, okay. And 
I mean, it was so popular, the show. I mean, you were suddenly propelled into this level of celebrity, which I found, I, I, you know, I, I, it didn't sit that comfortably with me. I, you know, I found, I'm, I'm, and, you know, as a London, I'm used to ducking and diving around and, you know, doing, doing my business. And suddenly, you know, people were stopping you and, you know, you were having to talk to people and, you know, and, and late night buses and tubes were just like no drunk people. You know, and you're like, ah, oh, man. And I was being paid 300 quid an episode. I couldn't afford to get taxes. You know, no, it was, yeah. like, <laughs> no, it was like I was far more famous than I was rich. Right. You know? <laughs> I mean, if I'd stayed because I had a contract for a year. If I'd stayed beyond, I could have started making some really serious money. Uh, money's never, as you can tell, so I've given everything out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Money's never really been a motivating factor for me. You and Eamon have a very famous episode. You, you know, you have a historic episode, Trouble and Strife. That's the first episode never to feature Sun Hill Station. It was one story all the way through. It's the first time they ever did it. It was Brian K. Adshed. Adshed. I mean, they're both of them. They are such lovely people, man. And we, and we, we had, I mean, the four of us had so much fun making those. I mean, that's probably when I look back. I mean, some of them, I mean, I, so, someone showed me a clip of, of one episode the other. I just could barely remember filming it, but the Mancini episodes, I mean, we had a blast doing those. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were, they were so much fun to make. Brian and Kay were just great people. The director, he was called Brian as well, I think. Was 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 so was great fun, and uh, yeah, it was the it's the most you know for me as well probably the most memorable episode, particularly the uh, the first one we did together. You put Brian Capron's head down the loo. <laughs> <laughs> you reached for the flush chain. I, I think I whispered something in his ear to the effect of what happened in that toilet before he put his head down it. <laughs> but... They had been in there. I have to say, the, the, the props department, the, you know, had been in there and scrubbed that toilet. I mean, you could have eaten your dinner off it, <laughs> but it still was a, it still was a nasty old toilet in a squat was a squat that house. My wife Tess, we watched that one together, and when you reach for a chain, she was going, "No, go on, do it, do it, do it," and she <laughs> grinned the Cheshire Cat grin on her face and the little cheer. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we're 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 fans of Ramsey. I mean, he, he's a really oh. really compelling character. Oh, thank you. Well, it was, I mean, I had, a, I had a lot of fun doing it. I really did. And, you know, helped by the fact I made one of my best friends during the show. Also, Kelly, who played WPC Brind, um, we're still friends. And, uh, yeah, Kelly and I travelled around Colombia together. So, yeah, so it was just, I mean, it was just, it was just really, really good fun. And uh, you know, You're the um, only copper ever got to drive a Porsche 911, you know. <laughs> I know, a horrible car. Oh, really? I mean, you know, well, I, yeah, they were, you're so low to the ground. The clutches, we, we were four different ones. We, I mean, they were all gold, meant to be the same one, gold Porsche, um, but it was actually four different ones. All of them, the clutch was really stiff. You kind of, you driving around London, you go at 30 miles an hour, you feel like you're going at eight miles an hour. <laughs> right. So you can, you know, you can't let it go. It's like a racetrack car. People were always like, oh, <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> I mean, they, they slightly ran because the only way he, he could have had a Porsche was that he was crooked. And they did set that up in the first episode. They had me on the edge of Portobello Market taking a bribe off a stall holder. <laughs> but they right. lost their nerve with it. And they and they were too worried, I think, about upsetting the police federation or, you know, so they wouldn't they wouldn't follow the corruption line. And I pushed quite hard because at the time there was, you know, quite a lot of stories coming out of corruption. Mm. And it was such a good storyline. You know, it would have been really interesting and, you know, and, and, you know, good to get them involved. How do you stop corruption in the police? I mean, you know, we, it's, it's something in Kenya we, we, we really struggle with. I mean, the police are so underpaid and undervalued and uh, undertrained. And so, you know, a, a traffic police just, you know, are, are bribing people the whole time. It's, uh, you know, and it's, and, you know, and it's one of the sort of pillars of a, of a sort of functioning democracy is to, is to try and address that. He kept his edge. There's an episode called Conflict. You and Trudy Goodwin are, are going to a house there's been a reported disturbance and uh, Trudy tries opening the back gate and it won't open. So it's locked. Do the business, Pete. I.e. she means climb over it. You just kick her down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trudy says, I, I meant climb over it, Pete. He says, it could be life or death in there. <laughs> <He> goes, <laughs> 
I mean, they were very good. I mean, because once you got you got your character, you know, there was one time where uh, and we were filming something in Brent Cross. We got kind of, I don't know, we obviously speeded through our last on the actual take and we got halfway up the escalator. I think I was with Eamon. And we, and, and we ran out of things to say. So I, I kind of ad-libbed a line about not being any crumpet around. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favourite lines, it's in your first episode. You cruise into CID to help them identify 60 grand's worth of saffron. And uh, you say, well, I could give you the Latin name if you like, but you'd only think I was being flesh. <laughs> that was mine. <laughs> that was the writer's. <laughs> well, how does it feel for you 30 years later to still be talking about Pete Ramsey? <laughs> you know, I, I, it makes me really chuffed. You know, it was so much fun doing that show. Um, I think it was a great show. Um, I'm so proud to have been part of it. And uh, I love the fact that people are still thinking about it. I mean, every so often I'm walking and we'll, we'll still go, yeah, oh, Ramsey. And, <laughs> and that's lovely. Man. That's a, it's a lovely thing. It, even somebody told me there was a Ramsey doll on sale. At no one way. Point. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, never, I never saw it. So, But, yeah, there, was, there were four. Uh, 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 it was a Ramsey doll. There was a Haynes doll, Eamon's character. Cryer and I think um, June Ackland. Oh, wonderful! Oh, collectors items are going to have to. I know, I know, I know. I should put a put a search on um, on eBay or something. See if any. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think he died because it was open ended, wasn't it? We obviously wanted to try and get you back at some stage. They did. They. I mean, we. I very nearly. We were gonna. We were gonna do a storyline of him being uh well one of the ideas was that he would be paralyzed um oh. uh, and and in a wheelchair which for a character like ramsey would have been massively challenging mm. um but he was yeah no they basically they shipped me off to a i mean last heard of in a sort of you know recovering in a nursing home in the isle of Wight. i think was the last last reference to it but i just you know i just I, you know, I kept thinking, maybe I'll go back. Maybe, oh, should I? And then other things started happening. And I did. I, that, that, I got that film in Africa, which was my first trip to Africa, and then spent five months traveling. Life took over. And then, and now the bill's finished. Yeah. <laughs> so he didn't, he didn't really die, did he? Because people, people. No. No. no, no. He's, he's still out Ramsey there. Is alive. No. Yeah. Ramsey lives. <laughs> He lives. He runs a charity in Africa. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and speaking of which, how can listeners of this, because I always ask people who've listened to this for free, you've very generously given your time to us and we're very grateful. How can people help SAFE? It's safekenya.org, O-R-G. And you can either donate through PayPal or um, just giving. So if people can help, fantastic. Huge thanks to Nick for his time, for taking us through his incredible journey and work with SAFE. I've got such respect and admiration for what he's done so far and for what he and his team are continuing to try and do. Uh, Documenting all of that uh, felt pretty important, actually. You can make a donation or read more about SAFE and how you could get involved via safekenya.org or you can give them a follow as well on Twitter at safe underscore Kenya. I would have loved to have chatted more about the bill and all of his other acting work with Nick but technology wasn't always on our side. We actually chatted for an hour and a half but the Skype kept timing out so we had to keep on going back and starting over and re-answering questions so... Hopefully one day I'll get to take Nick for a much-deserved, well-earned pint, pick his brains a bit more about Ramsey. He's a fantastic actor, but obviously he's doing some really important stuff out there. So my respect to you, Nick, if you're listening to this. Thank you very much indeed for your time. And it's to all of you at home that uh, I say a huge thank you for your support this year. The Bill podcast basically was a sequel to my book, All Memories, Great and Small, which I spent 18 months writing, was lucky enough to get published. And that takes readers behind the scenes of all 90 episodes of the BBC's All Creatures, Great and Small. 
I managed to track down 60 cast and crew and interviewed them, including Christopher Timothy, Peter Davison, Carol Drinkwater and the late, great Robert Hardy. Once that was published, which was last December, I was very tempted to write another book. My uh, my beloved and ever-patient wife, Tess, did urge me to take some time out because I have a job, as a, uh, I work for a digital media agency in London, which is incredibly fulfilling, but my role changed whilst I was doing the book. So I was doing a lot more creative edits, making things for uh, uh, all the movie studios, for their Facebook and Twitter accounts and Instagram. And it's fantastic fun. So I thought, well, I'll take some time out, then that's fine. I'll um, I'll dive into some new box sets. Then I watched the bill and was frustrated at the lack of special features, but the total lack of special features. I desperately wanted to hear what all these actors had to say about this fantastic television programme, which I'd grown up watching and uh, was rediscovering. I lapped them all up so quickly. The network DVDs, so now I've been tracking down the shock ones. Uh, which is uh, an expensive hobby, but um, worth it. It all began by sending an email to Mr. John Isles, and John being such a legend that he very kindly responded and took me up on the opportunity uh, to do a podcast. And the rest is history. So uh, my, my huge thanks this year. It all began with John Isles. He's a legend. And I've been able to, re- uh, to work with John, uh, actually hiring him to do a voiceover for a film called Blade of the Immortal. So that was really nice. And to my old pal Ben Payton, who's always been a champion of my efforts. And to all of this year's interviewees, thank you. Chris Humphreys, Andrew McIntosh, Larry Dan, Suzanne Maddock, Trudy Goodwin, Ashley Gunstock, Barbara Thorne, Mark Powley, and Nick Redding. Big thanks also to the house band, Johnny Fleming, Rich Giroso, Colin Cavanaugh, and Simon Oswald for your terrific theme cover. And big thanks to all of you for all your support, all your retweets. Uh, people like Karen Carpenter, Paul Morris, Andrew Ruff, Liam Rudden, Luke Elkins, Paul Dunn, Cameron Yardy, The Billiton, the Bill fans 16, the Bill fans, the Bill underscore, we are cult. Uh, all, all these lovely people that uh, are very kind to retweet all my announcements and share them on Facebook. I haven't met any of you guys in person, but uh, I am grateful for all your support. Yeah, I, I'm very grateful to you guys, I and mean, it's for you that I that I make this, and so we can uh, we can all enjoy some memories about our uh, one of our favourite shows. It is Christmas, so I'm going to take a little bit of uh, time out to uh, enjoy the festivities myself. The Bill Podcast will be back for series two. I've been lucky enough to get a few two passes. I'm going to take a little bit of time out because I've got uh, a number of podcasts in the bank and be with my ever-patient wife, Tess. Thank you for all your support and putting up with me watching so many episodes of The Bill at home, editing the podcasts on our commute together to work. She's a saint, is my Tess, and I'm looking forward to spending Christmas with her. So everyone out there, give your thumbs up and a big round of applause to Tess because she puts up with an awful lot from this humble podcaster. Well, that was a long outro, wasn't it? Um, I thought I ought to make up a bit of time because uh, I'd have loved to have talked to Nick more, but um, technology wasn't on our side that morning. But uh, I'm really chuffed to have spoken to a great man. And it's from one bad boy to the original bad boy of the bill. I can't believe that I've actually been able to interview one of the world's finest actors. I'm really excited about you guys hearing this. So here's a little clip to take you into um, to 2018. In the meantime, wishing you all a very Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and I think I said this in the first podcast, keep watching the bill. Next time on the Bill Podcast. I decided before we shot anything to add a scar, so I can't quite remember where it is, but I remember sitting in makeup every morning and having this scar applied to my face. 
and then at the end of the day having it taken off and everyone else wouldn't bother with any of that they were all you know end of the day they'd be coming for a pint and i'd be yeah i'm just going back into makeup and they're like ah, you know, so they'd be in the pub first but i think it was a good decision because he wasn't me you know mm. i have a level of sarcasm and i can be quite rude but i think apart from that the muzzle and i talk and choose really 